peace and mercy are yours from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, my dear friends. There are some symbols, some icons, some logos that are almost universally recognized. You think about perhaps the golden arches. You can pretty much go anywhere in the world, and if you see those golden arches, you know that there is a McDonald's just around the corner. Or how about this logo? Anywhere you go in the world, even the most remote corners of the globe, people recognize those words. Maybe they don't know exactly what they say, but they know what they mean. And businesses will spend millions of dollars each year on advertising to promote a lifestyle, to promote uh, nostalgia, or to promote emotions or feelings connected with their products, trying to get people to buy into that lifestyle, trying to get people to buy into that success. And because they have spent millions, perhaps billions of dollars to create these iconic images and businesses, often their profits soar. So when you look at the business of Jesus, you may not think of it as being all that successful for the earthly minded. When you think of the lifestyle that Jesus promotes, it's not necessarily all that Healing to many. When you think of the emotions, when you think of the nostalgia connected to the business of our Savior, perhaps it's not the success that many people want to achieve. It's very clear that most people don't understand the business of our Savior. They don't understand what our Savior has brought to the world. Because the business of our Savior was the business of his father. And that business is saving souls and saving lives for eternity. We see that business of our Savior today, that business that we have the privilege to be part of in our lesson today from John chapter 2. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. When the Jews demanded of him, What miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. The Jews replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple. You are going to raise it in three days. The temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Now as a faithful believer, Jesus had made this pilgrimage into Jerusalem countless times. He was following the Old Testament law that required people to go to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast and the festival of the Passover. This was that remembrance of how God had rescued the nation of Israel from that slavery in Egypt and brought them to the promised land. This time was going to be a little bit different. Jesus had now begun his public ministry. He had chosen his 12 disciples. And while Jesus may not have been a household name yet, and all eyes weren't on him, very soon people would be hearing about his power, about his words, about his miracles. So there you have Jesus with the disciples and thousands of others who had gathered in Jerusalem for this festival. And many of them, like Jesus and the disciples, had come for the right reasons, to give thanks, to celebrate for what God had done for the people of Israel. But there were also plenty of people that had come for the wrong reasons. They came simply out of obligation, trying to fulfill the letter of the law. 
And then there were others. Others who saw the booming market in sacrificial animals and they thought they would make a, a quick denarius here. They had turned the temple into a marketplace. Now before this, they had set up their markets outside the city to accommodate all the people, but for convenience sake, it eventually drifted into the court of the Gentiles. The serious and solemn business of worship in the temple had been replaced by the bleeding sounds of, of sheep and the haggling of the barters looking for a better price. Clearly, human business had taken the place of that serious business that should have been happening in the temple. It's no wonder then that Jesus was so upset. But maybe as we see Jesus running around with that whip, driving out the money changers and the sellers, that's not the picture we have of the cool, calm, collected, peace-loving Jesus. We want that kind of Jesus, don't we? Not a Jesus who goes after people for sin. But maybe that's the Jesus we should expect. The disciples understood this as they recalled the Old Testament prophecies concerning him that said, zeal for your house will consume me. You see, we shouldn't expect that Jesus is going to put up with or tolerate sin, sinful attitudes, twisting of scriptures, ignoring the truth. Jesus hates sin. He said as much many times in his word. Jesus hates when churches will just sit back and, and tolerate sin. He hates it when churches will twist scriptures in order to gain new members. He hates it when churches decide to just pick and choose what they want to believe. See, my friends, Jesus he can't stand counterfeit religious attitudes. But before we start picking on everyone else, we need to turn the gaze to ourselves, Because often that sinful attitude infects our heart as well. How many times in our life do we not go out there and do things and follow Jesus' words simply out of obligation rather than from the heart. How many times in our life have we treated God's word with disrespect? Or maybe we just do it out of convenience sake. How many times do we come to church here on a Sunday morning and we're counting down the minutes, hoping that it won't go over an hour? Because church is about me, right? It's about my convenient how many times my friends have we had zeal for our father's house like jesus did how many times do we get excited about going to worship or do we begrudgingly go because our parents told us we had to or our spouse nudged us and gave us that guilt trip you see my friends Maybe we shouldn't be so surprised then by people turning God's house, the temple, into a marketplace when often we have turned our hearts into a marketplace as well, but even worse than that, into a garbage pit. Because we often go out there, don't we, and we fill ourselves up with the filth of this world. Maybe we shouldn't be surprised that God's house in Jesus' day had been turned into a den of traitors when so often we have traded our heart for a den of lies. So often, my friends, we have been less about our Father's business and more about our own and our own priorities. Now, I'm going to say something for a second and I don't want you to take it as an excuse that you can use later on. But I know this, I know this is a struggle for each and every one of us to follow after our Savior, to buy into that lifestyle that he is promoting because our sinful heart doesn't want it. 
We are enemies. We are hostile to God. And when we look at the message of the cross, it seems like utter foolishness. And so many times, suckered into believing the shallow philosophies of this world, the advanced theories that try and disprove the existence of God, or at least to disprove his power. And with so much standing in our way, we struggle to stay in God's business. We grow tired of the, of the daily grind, of all the sacrifices that we have to make of waiting for promises that are yet unseen. My dear friends, when we are not about God's business, when we are not daily connected to his word, you see what can easily happen. You see how easy it is for people to drift away from God and the business at hand in favor of their own lives. Maybe only coming back to God because they, they want a God who will be there for them in the instant that they need him to provide. But a God who turns a blind eye to everything else that they have been doing in their life. But my friends, we can't have it both ways. Our Savior knew why he was here. He was not here selling gimmicks or false promises. Jesus was always about his father's business. In fact, you go back a, a ways in Jesus' life when he was a teenager, you see that as he's in the temple, he was all about his father's business. He was not there to sell the faith. He was not there to promote something and, and to make a, a quick, get-rich-quick scheme. That's not what Jesus was all about. Jesus was in the business of saving lives for eternity. And yet, when we see what Jesus offers, don't we always want more? Don't we always want him to prove his love, his power, to even prove who he really was? You see, that's exactly what happened in the temple that day. As soon as Jesus had cleared the temple, they wanted proof, didn't they? Prove your authority. Now this would become a reoccurring theme in Jesus' ministry. No matter what he did, if he had fed thousands with just a small lunch, they wanted him to prove himself. If he cured people, they wanted him to prove himself. And when Jesus didn't live up to their sinful expectations, many of them drifted away. But back to the temple that day. These religious leaders, they should have known better. After all, these religious leaders had been given the solemn duty to be overseers in the temple. They had let this marketplace take place under their watch. If you're talking about somebody destroying the temple, it had already happened years before this. The temple wasn't destroyed by some invading army that came in and, and tore down the walls. The temple had really been destroyed by a lack of doing God's business. They had given up on God's business. It was all about their own business in the temple. It was all about their man-made laws, about their shallow observations. And if you want to take it a step further, those leaders in the temple, they would be the ultimate temple destroyers. The temple was standing right in front of them. Their Lord and their Savior, the promised Messiah. And they would take that temple and they would nail him to the cross. Because they thought they had already figured out their own way to salvation. They didn't want to have to listen to this poor, uneducated carpenter's son telling them about their bread and butter. They thought they had it all figured out. And they didn't really want proof. They didn't want to believe. They simply wanted proof 
to show everyone that Jesus was just one of many frauds. Now, if you think about it, in some ways, we're still often looking for proof. We're still often looking for signs. You see that among church bodies and, and people, perhaps the born againer who's always on your case, trying to get you to, to nail down that exact time and that exact place and that exact way that you came to faith. Or maybe that covetous Christian who's always out there trying to get those external gifts of the Holy Spirit, you know, the ones that are showy that people can see. Or maybe it's simply the Christian who thinks that it's by their own works. Or maybe perhaps the merits of some others that gets you into heaven. But you see, my friends, those things don't work. Maybe it makes a little sense. After all, we want to feel special. We want to feel like somehow we have earned or we've contributed our way to heaven. But my dear friends, our Savior was not about the business of showing us how to earn our way to heaven. No, our Savior's business was about saving lives. And he was about showing us that he already has earned heaven for us. That Jesus was willing to come into this world and take the punishment that we deserved, that God's justice would be served. And now heaven is wide open to each and every one of us. Jesus was all about the business of saving lives eternally. And now, my friends, it's our business to go out there and share that message with others. Now, maybe from a worldly point of view, the lifestyle, the nostalgia, the hope that Jesus offers, maybe from a business model, didn't look very successful. But because of the Holy Spirit working in our hearts, we know that it is the difference between life and death. Perhaps the lifestyle that Jesus offers us may seem a bit dated, a bit backwards, but we know that it is the one that gives us eternal life. You see, Jesus offers something that no business can offer, and that is peace and security for eternity. Jesus was always about the Father's business. To this very day, he's carrying out the Father's business, making sure you hear the truth, making sure your lives are changed. If you're talking about logos, talking about symbols, there's perhaps not one symbol for us that has such great meaning as the cross. The cross is our Savior's life work. But the empty tomb is proof of his success. My dear friends, let Jesus work in your heart. Let him conduct his business in your life. Be all about your father's business until that day that he brings you home to him. Amen. Please stay. <laughs>